Okay, then we are live with, uh, well, the meaning of space rocks, episode 42 of Space Rocks Uplink. And in just a moment's time, we're going to bring in the, uh, well, the, the Time Lord himself, <laughs> Mark McCorkran. How are you doing? I'm good, Alex. How are you? How are very you? well, very well. Um, well, how fantastic to see you. And, um, well, I've got to say, well, I think I know uh, immediately what that background comes from, and um, what a brilliant reason to do so. Episode uh, 42. Mi mixing Space metaphors Rocks. today, mixing my science fiction uh, genres. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. So I should, I'm should. i going to take this off, but I have to explain the Doctor Who scarf. My, uh, my family have been conducting a time travel um, through my life this week, just ahead of my birthday, going to places I've lived uh, in the past all around the world. So this evening was Arizona. Um, and I will, I shouldn't, but you know, there's even beer involved, um, cook, cooking dinners for each and every location. So we've been to Hawaii, we've been to Ireland, we've been to Germany and, uh, it's the whole Doctor Who thing. So there's a TARDIS on the door of our living room and I go through it every night and I have no idea what's awaiting me. So, uh, it's been great fun, but uh, as I say, it's hot. So I'll take that off. And, uh, and then of course the background, as you know, is from the 2005 film version of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, and we all know the relevance of the number 42, and this is Uplink episode 42. So there you go. Indeed. Well, I guess, uh, well, you could say that we're going to be exploring the meaning of Mars tonight. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I have to say, um, if anyone's familiar with Space Rocks, they'll, of course, know um, our guests um, tonight and who they are and what they're up to. But if you're new to Space Rocks and what we are, Mark, uh, uh, who is joining us tonight? Well, if indeed, if anybody's new, and there may well be people that have come over from the uh, UK Space Agency and the UK Space Office's um, Mars Day. So that's Alex Milas over there, and I'm Mark McCorkran, uh, Senior Advisor for Science and Exploration at the European Space Agency, and we run Space Rocks together. And we've been doing a number of live public events over the last few years, and of course in the last year, doing it online. Um, and two of the people who've been part of events in the past um, and the host of two, both of our big events in London, Dallas Campbell, uh, who's a science broadcaster, um, writer, a bon viveur astronaut fan, um, and uh, has been co-hosting today, the Mars Day, um, with our other guest, Susie Imber, who's an associate professor for space science at the University of Leicester. Um, involved in the mission which is on its way to Mercury, Bepi Colombo mission uh, with the European Space Agency, but also it's well known from um, UK TV for having been on the, um, I can't remember the name of the, the, the program now exactly, but you know, do you have what it takes or you want to be an astronaut? Uh, and she was the winner. So this was a program done with Chris Hadfield and other people going through astronaut training uh, and selection. Um, and Susie's been a speaker at one of our events, so it's just a great pleasure to have them both with us this evening to, at the end of their very long day, because they've been running this program all day, um, I suspect we may go off piste more than once, but that's the whole aim of Space Rocks, right? Indeed, it's a good thing. So without further ado, um, we're going to bring them in um, through the airlock. We're going to start saying that every time now. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Dallas and Susie, how are you doing? Hey. How are you this evening? Hi. Hello, right. hello. Well. I've what changed my backdrop, so you now you've got to guess it. Alex got it straight away. It's Jodrell Bank. It is. And what's hovering above it? A Vogon Constructor Ship. Exactly. What? <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear him on my mm. pop quiz team. <laughs> exactly. Which, epi which, which episode of Uplink is this, Dallas? 42. Well done. There you go. Uh, so, uh, funnily enough, we were just talking to Andy Aldrin, son of Buzz Aldrin. Mm -hmm. Yes. He's a massive hitchhiker fan. Very and, good. And we were meant to be talking about, you know, stuff. Mars. And we ended up talking about <laughs> Vogon poetry. In fact, Dallas ended up from memory. Shuttle reciting... buggly, thy micturations are to me as gurgle gabble blotchets on a lurgid bee. Group, I implore ah! thee. Hunting, turling drones. There's nothing worse than Vogon. <laughs> there's nothing worse than Vogon poetry. Our heads are supposed to explode. It's the right? Third worst in the universe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with, anyway, that, sorry. With, that, with that in mind, we're just going to talk the details of Mars geology with you this evening. So you've had your fun. All right. We can do. I can <laughs> now do we're that. getting serious. <sighs> Yes, yeah. well, we can do more. Alex, Alex, stop us now. Alex, put some <laughs> sense into this before we just can run Can I tell you my other hitchhiker story very quickly? Please. Uh, a few yeah. years ago, I did a, a thing with Frank Drake, obviously Frank Drake, he of the Drake Equation, 
And we were sort of talking about aliens, like, you, you know, because you're with Frank Drake. You're so going to you talk do. about the aliens. Although he might be bored of that conversation. I, well, he probably is a bit bored of the conversation. Anyway, but we, I ended up talking about Hitchhiker and he'd, he'd never heard of it. I'm like, what, what do you mean you'd never heard of it? He'd never heard of it. So we had to rush. It was his birthday. So we rushed out and we bought him a complete Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy <laughs> and presented him <laughs> with it. <laughs> So anyway, I feel that you was my, gave, that's my you gave contribution Drake, to, to, to something. One, one has to imagine, I don't I have no idea whatsoever whether Douglas Adams, in some sense, coming up with a number which kind of comes out of something, was he aware of the Drake equation? Was it a symmetric relationship? That's a good question, actually. I have no idea. Mm, I don't. Because I, I, I mean, have you ever looked into it? Because this whole, you know, where does 42 come from? I'm not that much of an uber geek that I've ever bothered right. to dig into it. But I mean, there's neither. lots of theories about what it where Not it comes since... from, but... <laughs> well, I'm, you know, uh, well, people may be joining us to talk about Mars. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put, oh, my, okay. yes. I'm going to put my imaginary Chekhov's gun up here on the wall and say that I have two equally compelling theories about 42 that I have heard. And even though Stephen Fry reputedly knows the answer because he was told what it means, he's sworn to secrecy and will <gasps> never reveal it. But there are two really good reasons. And if uh, if Mark's nice to me, I'm joking. Um, uh, what, again? Uh, again? How many times do I have to be nice to you? Revisit it later, because I think I want to revisit. It. See, I just thought it was just the randomness of it that makes it interesting, rather than. And I think all this talk of our secret meanings might be a MacGuffin. Mm. It could be. It could be. And you know, I've I've taken my Doctor Who scarf off, and of course, Douglas Adams even wrote the, the famous missing episode as well. Yes, right? with yeah. the Mona Lisa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is my favourite Doctor Who episode with. Um, you know, what's his face? Monty Python. It, exactly. John, that was, please. That, Thank that, you. That, what's happened to my brain today? It's just That gone. surfaced somewhere online in the last week. I hadn't seen that clip in years of John yeah. Cleese posing in front of the TARDIS. That's right. Yes. It's yeah, really yeah, funny. Yeah. It's a good clip. It's okay. Good. We miss Douglas Adams. We do miss him. What, a, what a mind he was. A great mind. I, can, I, can I share the two ideas that I've heard? Come on. Yes. Let's yes. do it now. Let's just do it now, okay? <laughs> Number one is Douglas Adams was a huge fan of computing. You know, back when computing was like a hobby, you know, the kind of thing that either you did because you worked for defense or astronomy, uh, you know, or perhaps you had like a home kit, which is who he was. Um, and uh, back then uh, uh, in a sort of like a, original um, programming languages, in order to create an asterisk, right? Um, you'd have to kind of create like a combination of alphanumeric codes and so on. The alphanumeric code for an asterisk, which as any programmer knows, could be a wildcard character. Mm -hmm. It means anything. Mm -hmm. Asterisk code is four and two. <gasps> so what's the meaning of life? Anything you want it to be. Oh, I All love right. it. That's the answer. That, I'm sure that's of it. That I've heard. And I right. We're going to vote afterwards and there's three of yes. us. So we'll have a time. <laughs> yeah. So I love that. And I am probably told it completely incorrectly, but it's something like that, right? We're going to go um, with it. We'll the second one is the meaning of life is for two, for two people. Oh. Uh, and I, oh. I, know, I know how schmaltzy it is, but um, Stephen Fry did say it's so simple and so obvious that it's just, beautiful and so there you go the, the two ideas yeah but i like the first one yeah me too <laughs> yeah particularly the the, the, since, the, to since there is a smart car called the 42 you know it's all being commercialized we can't be having that i know that's the thing yeah yeah, yeah. Hey, alex anyway, alex what, what are we supposed to be talking about this evening i have no well, idea well we're talking about the meaning of mars um tonight um and uh yeah, I, I guess just to kind of just sort of ski back into the um you know uh, uh i guess groove that we're thinking about talking about tonight so i'm just going to start with a bit of a a bit of a big one um susie i wondered if you could start us out why is everyone so interested in mars oh yes this is a good one blimey uh, that's a, I know, that's a like, <laughs> question number one <laughs> Uh, well, we're interested in Mars for loads of different reasons. Uh, lots of people are interested in Mars because it's where we might go next. It might be a destination, the moon and then Mars. So we want to find out a bit more about Mars. Planetary scientists like me are interested in Mars because we don't really understand lots of features about it. Did it have water in the past? You know, could there have been life there? It's a fairly fundamental question, actually, if you think about um, our existence, thinking about our place in the universe, it gets quite deep. And actually, could there have been life on Mars? You know, it's an obvious one for us to ask. And it's a place we can get to and actually find the answer. You know, we're talking about the Drake equation, life elsewhere in the universe. Lots of people think there could be, like, including me, thinks there could have been life somewhere else in, in the universe. It's going to be really hard to find out because probably it was a really long way away and we may never get any signal that tells us the answer. 
but we could go to Mars and if we found life there, it would be pretty profound. It would really tell us something about how often life might evolve in different planetary systems all over the universe. So it's quite profound actually. Yeah, it's always it's just always had that sort of enigmatic quality, I think, Mars. Mm. Uh, particularly, I mean, for the ancient civilizations, for the Babylonians and the Romans and stuff, you'd see this strange kind of, I mean, planet means wanderer. And with Mars, you would see this kind of wandering red colored dot in the sky. And also, of course, it had this kind of rather strange loop the loop retrograde motion, which was rather odd and rather. So it always had mm, mysterious. Then, mysterious kind of quality. And then as our kind of focus became a little bit closer of course you had people like Galileo and Tarko Brahe and all these scientists who would look at Mars through telescopes and we could suddenly see not just a dot but it would turn into a disc with kind of little you know shadows on it and then our imaginations of course went into overdrive because here we are on our, this little island earth in the middle of this cosmic ocean and when you live on a little island and you see other islands the first thing you do is imagine who else is going to be on there and so we've always imagined I mean, with the moon as well, we've imagined people, Lumerians living on the moon, but Martians have always kind of been there in our psyche because it's a natural thing to imagine other minds, whether there perhaps are, are none, but that's what human brains tend to do. And of course, you know, you know the, the history, of, history of the Martian is bizarre and strange. We've imagined all kinds of beings. I found a really interesting one the other day, actually. Uh, someone thinks that there was a giant eye on a stalk coming out of Mars that looked at itself. Did you see this? I tweeted it the other day. <laughs> I found it in a, I can't remember where I found it, but it was a, you know, from the early, early 20th century. But, but that, yes. that kind of goes to another thing we were talking about earlier, which is about how the human brain, it likes to see things where there are, yes. you can look at a tree and it looks like there's a face somehow in the, in the tree and looking at Mars, certainly there's always been a history of pareidolia. Is that what it's called? Yes, it's just that sort of psychological phenomenon of seeing, seeing things. Seeing I, things. I, I cut my paper doilies into human faces just just for the pun. <laughs> <laughs> that's, like the, that's like Earth's nichest gag. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. no, but places, but, but yeah. let, let me jump in because, of course, what what you're both alluding to is the fact that that you know until relatively recently in human history we didn't really have a clue. We were seeing things which and we were speculating about things, life forms, and 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 you know it's not just Mars, Venus. Until as late as the the early '60s, it was quite possible that Venus was just hot and tropical and they had jungles on yeah. it. Until we sent spacecraft and until we started making measurements. That, that made sense. So, so Mars, in a way, why are we still so fascinated when actually we now know it's a completely disappointing place? Because it I mean, looks you don't so want familiar. to you don't want to live there, right? It looks so Maybe. familiar. You know, we well. even though we know there are no Martians, <laughs> although some people still think there are kind of you know people like Richard Hoagland who are still promoting conspiracy theories about the face of Mars and all this kind of stuff and ancient ruined civilization. There is a familiarity about Mars. You know, when we look at these pictures from these rovers and orbiters and we look and we see river deltas and we see mountain ranges and volcanoes, it could be the high desert of America or it could be anywhere on Earth. And so that sort of familiarity, hmm. I think, is 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 what is what fascinates us. But and also, the possibility. well, yeah, I mean, well, we know there's no life or we suspect there may be no life there now. Actually, there could be a, a history of life, a, a past life that had started hmm. to develop and then for lots of different reasons perhaps um, not progressed any further. And so starting to dig down, look under the surface, there is still that possibility that we could find something there that indicates that life might have started. And that's quite tantalizing. Yeah. yeah. And also, we know that Mars was was warmer and wetter. Yeah. And so we those and things, had a magnetic field and had a magnetic field. So it's, it's the natural thing to want to ask. Well, if yeah. it was warmer and wetter and it was like an Earth, a twin of Earth. Yeah. And we know that life on Earth started four billion years ago, or whenever it started three. I can't remember when it started. Mark knows. But three, three and a half, three yeah. and a half. So they, it's the, it's that we want to know. Yeah. If it, but if it but that, but it's that interesting point, isn't it? Because you're describing the the modern day reasons to want to go there because yeah. scientifically, exploration wise. And when I talk about you wouldn't want to live there, of course, there are a whole bunch of people who think it actually is like the Earth, that it is the Arizona desert, or that you know you could wander around, and it isn't in that sense. So I'm curious why that. You know, is there a, a sociological reason why people are still fascinated? I mean, I'm wondering, of course, well, in the, the modern, is it is it the fantasy of wanting to flee a broken earth and that the, kind of thing? Right? It's the frontier. We've always been drawn by frontiers, haven't we? You know, the, the idea of exploration on Earth has always been that sort of psychological need to explore. So the movement west in America, or going to America, the history of maritime exploration, you know, the search for the Northwest Passage, all these famous 
um, forms of exploration have been drawn by that sense of frontier, that sense of the edge, wanting to know what's there. Mm. And Mars is the kind of logical step. It's the it's the furthest frontier that we could imagine, you know, humans going to. You know, we can you know we talk about sort of Jovian moons of maybe, but Mars is really the the last kind of outpost. But I'm but I'm going to dig in just one last time, Alex. Yeah, yeah, no, because, on, because I think you're absolutely right. There are explorers that go to places and yeah. you know they go to Antarctica, but nobody's ever ended up going really to live in Antarctica because it's we've explored it more than a century ago, and people go there to do science. Yeah. And the edge of going to Mars for exploration is, is very rational, whether it's just to go and put your boots there or to find life there. But then there's this discussion about people going to live. And if you go back to your analogy about people going to America, they didn't go because they were exploring, they went to flee something in Europe or because they were promised more than they had where they were. Yeah. It was a sociological reason to go there. And that's what I'm interested in that, you know, that second order sense. Why would average citizens want to go there? Other, you know, where it's not a really nice place, right? Lots of people died on the journey to America, but at least there was air when they got there. Well, that's, yes. I don't know, Brexit? Or, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's... Bingo. That is a really good, I mean, I think, the, I think the Antarctica analogy is the sort of best analogy. You know, you're right, Antarctica isn't a place we can live, but we want to do science. We're interested in, in there, and we will go through hardship in order to do it, that sense of exploration. Well, and some of but, those expeditions were, were years long, weren't they? And I think people, there's a difference between I want to pop to Mars for a few <laughs> years and see what it's like, and I want to go to Mars and never come back. And I think if yeah. people really thought hard about what they would like, they might say, I want to pop to Mars for five minutes and come back, but they may not say, I want to never come back. I think that's quite a big step, actually. Yeah, I think it's a different, I think it's a different thing from the, why the, why we, you know, they'd all jumped onto the Mayflower to escape religious mm. persecution in Europe yeah. or, or, or whatever it is. Because you're right, you know, Earth, Nando's, Mars, no Nando's. <laughs> <laughs> this, there's a reason to go right there oh no that wasn't what you meant actually there probably is wi-fi on mars. is that what you'd miss you'd miss Nando's. Yeah. well you know there's just the basics you'd well maybe that's maybe that's that would all be an advanced nando's party well not mad nando but do you know what i mean would, not chickens well it, it comes to my my you know you know point about if, if the people go to mars i mean if you're really serious about putting a million people on mars as some kind well, who's of who's serious about no one's well, serious <laughs> Yeah. People, people are serious about talking about it let's yes, put it that yeah, way exactly and yeah. you know i'm sure you've got in fights on social media about this with the usual suspects um there's sort of two groups right i mean if you really meant it as a lifeboat to preserve life against an asteroid strike or something bonkers. well yeah. but you know who are the groups one you either do it by a lottery randomly from the entire population of the earth to get the maximum everything diversity you could you could get right because if that's what you're doing you want the most diverse group of people to go yeah um, but then that's by a lottery, and that's a million is one in 10,000 people on the planet Earth today, roughly. That means you and I don't know anybody, because I don't know 10,000 people, roughly, you know? you know? So chances are you don't know anybody. Am I really, you know, why should I send them to look after my genetic heritage? Not quite how altruism works, I don't think. But the other one is you just send a bunch of rich people, because they can all, all afford to go there, and they're just going to turn up and say, I'm sorry, I've just paid a lot of money to come here. Who's cleaning, yeah. the, to who's cleaning the toilets? <laughs> who's making the coffee? Where, where are those people yeah. that do my thing? So anyway, yeah. it's Alex. I suppose it's that, that idea of kind of transhumanism, this idea of, you know, we see it throughout sort of cultures and throughout literature and everything, this idea of, of humanity spreading itself through the, through the cosmos as, as, as a central idea. I, I sort of don't know. Is that something that just comes in waves of fashion? I mean, we're talking about it at the moment, I suppose, because of people like Elon Musk. And then a, a couple of years ago, the Mars One idea, we're going to send a bunch of colon, colonists to, to the Mars. But that sort of seems to all sort of fall on a bit flat. Well, I think the idea of, of sending people there to kind of keep humanity alive is interesting because I suspect that they have a more tenuous sort of grip on life if they're, if they're on the surface of Mars than we do on the surface of the Earth. So I'm yeah, not really yeah, sure yeah. that one holds water at the moment anyway. Well, yeah. Well, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, in multiple ways. And, you know, part of the reason why we called it Mars or Bus, you know, Mark and I, you know, um, put a little thought into these, you know, uh, frameworks Wait, for these conversations. Sorry? We can tell you've put thought into it. Yeah, it was the, <laughs> well, it was the question mark. We debated the question mark for several days. Sometimes we, just, <laughs> yeah. sometimes we just throw a dart at the wall, you know, I'll be honest. No, not at all. But, um, but I think it's because the, the, the subtext of all that is um, Mars, but at what cost, 
right? Yes. Um, you know, because uh, it's not just scientific um, uh, discovery that we are after there. Um, for many people, uh, the idea of going to Mars, you know, it does suggest, well, we'll just terraform it. We'll just settle there. We've messed it up here on Earth, and so we're going to go there. And so that's an immediate cost, right? Because perhaps that distracts us from the immediate concerns of the climate crisis here on Earth. But also there are other things as well, right? You know, the idea of um, settling another planet does bring in that frontier mentality. But of course, this came at tremendous cost to the people going, well, presumably um, there are not people on Mars, you know, but but at the same time, you know, uh, the whole concept of colonization has with it, uh, you know, a, a terrible history of exploitation and so on. And so it's not necessarily a utopian solution. In fact, it perhaps it introduces all kinds of complexities and problems. So is there a danger perhaps in promoting the idea that we're just gonna go there and and suddenly well, live there? Because I just, I think it's so in the realms of fantasy. I don't think it is a danger. And I, I totally appreciate your ideas, you know, colonization, the history of exploration of, on planet Earth has always generally ended really badly. Um, I mean, luckily there, there aren't any people to, there's any robots on Mars, we could exploit them, um, but they probably don't mind so much. Um, but I, I think it's so in the realms of fantasy that that's where it is. It's not, a, you know, it's not a serious. Is it a serious thing well, that people I, are going to colonize? Just, it well, it depends on whose Twitter feed you follow. I, <laughs> I honestly don't I, think we know enough about Mars and its environment to begin to think seriously about about doing that. You or know, it's so far we just away. Don't know enough. It's so far away in our. Hang, hang on, though. I watched The Martian, and clearly. <laughs> That explains how you're going to do it, right? You know, uh, uh, Dallas, I was following you the other day. It, it seems oh. you're a big fan yourself. I get really cross about the Martian. <laughs> and he, this, I, this is why you invited you on. Come on. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to get into trouble here because I know it's everyone's favorite film. My problem with it is, my problem with it is, you know, I, I grew up, I grew up, I, I, I read Defoe, I read Robinson Crusoe, you know, and that, that's, that's the great, book on which really what the, what the themes of which the Martian is based on being stranded alone and my problem with the Martian film was particularly it's the it's a, I think it's probably a Ridley Scott problem at the end of Alien when Ripley is escaping the Nostromo and it's a brilliant last third of the movie and it's incredibly tense and she's got to get off the Nostromo before it blows up and there's no dialogue in it at all we just watch her doing this problem solving mission and she and she manages to escape but with the Martian, he's just constantly doing this narration to camera, and it's really annoying. And I just think if you just <laughs> chopped out all of Mark Watney's dialogue, it would be a really good film, and we could just watch him doing all this problem solving. But this constant telling, I just think, is bad storytelling. So, so Perfect, Dallas's thing. issue with the whole film Sorry. is the way it's filmed, not any of the kind of crazy science that happens. <laughs> yeah, well, but also the story. <laughs> but you know what I mean, and also just all that kind of bants about disco music. I'm like, you know, that joke fine once, but he does it like eight times. Yeah, and that's it's just true. Really annoying. Maybe the book's better. I don't know. I have the book on the shelf over here, it's but good. I, you know, should I, I, I read it? I haven't read it because, you know, the film pissed me off so much. Sorry. It pissed me uh, off as well. Why did it uh, piss me off? I want to know. Am well, I... because, you know, Susie alluded to it, right? I mean, this, the scientific issues, it was, it's one of those films, and I hope Paul Franklin isn't listening this evening because it's my, my, my same feeling about Interstellar, really, is if you're going to set me up and tell me endlessly that this is a scientifically accurate representation of something, um, unlike Star Wars, which just doesn't even care, right? So I have no stake in it being scientifically accurate. But The Martian went on and on and on. The book may be far better, and I've heard that it is, but the film just blew it with, you know, the whole rocket falling over because of a dust storm. Wouldn't happen. Um, the atmosphere is too thin. It just doesn't happen. And then the whole business with the the, 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 the one bar blowout on his on his space habitat on his habitat, and then sealing up with duct tape and a piece of plastic. I mean, one bar yeah. over a several meters. I mean, please. And then he gets I into think... space, but you know, with his blinking stripped down rocket and his space glove and everything, it's just rubbish. But yeah, just annoyed I, I, me. I, I, I for that, I don't mind when si when. You know the science isn't accurate. I'm I'm all for artistic. I license. do. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I mind. Correct. Me, correct. But for me, it's a it's a storytelling issue. It's a, you know yeah. you could have made that film really interesting if it had been a silent movie, and actually he didn't speak doing like his video diary, and I uh, you know because it's just exposition and actually just strip yeah. all that away and let's see this guy really suffering on a planet, and maybe he wouldn't talk or if he does talk it's it's yeah. I mean, I it's, in some ways, let, let's talk about the other. There's the three, the big three, in a way, of those relatively recent films, scientific accuracy. I mean, Interstellar is not even worth it. The black hole is pretty, 
but this whole business of love saving the day in the library i still haven't figured that out you know i used to hang out in the library as a student and it, falling in love with What's somebody across love the library you didn't, it didn't help the me at all. were you in the uh, barbara cartland section of the library well i don't know but um but gravity is the other one and, ah! and, weird, and weirdly and you know go well okay but actually weirdly gravity tells the story better i think uh it's got nonsense moments in it of course it does but actually, it's a bit more like your silent movie because she's on her own a lot and she's not talking to camera, apart from when Clooney turns up as a ghost and then talks to Clooney. Oh, all right, I know, but, you know. Go on, Susie, tell us. T tell why, us why it's what's terrible. What's wrong with Gravity? Oh, I just, I just <laughs> I disliked everything about Gravity on. So, okay, there's one thing I liked about it. I liked, and it's a long time since I saw it, but I liked the fact that space debris caused the problem. I thought, yeah, space debris. Let's give space debris a bit of time on the old airways. Fantastic. And then after that, I just felt like it all went horribly wrong and I hated every second at the very end. And I never say this. I just wanted her to somehow, like as she sort of came out of the capsule from memory and she went onto the beach and I just thought, let a meteorite come and just... <laughs> Yeah, that's how sort of angry I was about that. And I'm not an angry person, but oh my goodness. She just drove me. I, was, I, I, was, I have a conflict of interest because I was a consultant on the film for the length of one phone call when somebody phoned me up and said, "Do you, Issa, do you have astronauts that have flown the shuttle and Soyuz, which we did at that point, because they wanted that, that multiple business of going through the various ones and yeah. i said well yes i do so you need to talk to these people so that was it so i'm contractually bound to say it's better than you're saying but uh... I, I had a problem with it My, there was a space suit issue with it um sandra bullock she was wearing a sock all, but the, the helmet was wrong oh was it yeah i was very obsessed about that okay I had a bit of a moment. You would actually. notice the space suit issue. Well, I was looking at it. And like, <laughs> of oh, everything. No, I was That's looking. They got, oh, they've got a proper. They've got a proper so you soft, soft suit, but then then the helmet didn't work. So anyway, but that, I don't mind. I don't mind the sort of scientific inaccuracies. I'm like I'm. I'm more forgiving than you scientists. Well, I I think I think Mark has a good point. I loved I loved uh, watching the Star Wars, the original Star Wars movie, because I don't even like. I know it's not science. It's not meant to be, and, and therefore I can sort of you know suspend all disbelief and I can totally buy into it. And I'm perfectly yeah. happy with it. Yeah. Well, I suppose this is an interesting thing though, isn't it? Because I mean, we talked a little bit about this popular preoccupation that we have with Mars specifically, and I can't think of any planet. I don't even think the moon has had anywhere near as many films made about it or going there or whatever else as, as Mars has, you know? And I guess all the way back to the, I guess the first time, when was it that the Martian canals, so-called Martian canals were you know, kind of spotted Scaparelli, Giovanni the, Scaparelli. the 1800s. Yeah. 1800s, yeah. So, yeah. so I mean, it's an interesting story. Sorry, I, sorry. Please, I, go I, ahead. No, 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 it's an interesting story, but of course, Scaparelli d didn't really mean them in terms of Martians. I mean, when he when he used the word canali, he simply meant ditch, because he looked through his telescope and saw these striations, these dark patches, and called them canali. And it wasn't, of course, until Percival Lowell whenever that was 19 something in Flagstaff, Arizona, early 1900s, took that word canali and, and, and sort of conflated it with intelligent design and thought, okay, these canals are actually ditches of, of some geoengineering program to bring water from the poles to the equatorial regions of Mars. And then the whole thing sort of, you know, that became, you know, the prevalent view for a long time. I mean, even the, the Mariner missions in the 1960s, they still used... Percival Lowell's drawings of Mars in these scientific missions with the kind of canals marked on them. Mm. What's fascinating, actually, just because it's current and occasionally, you know, we like to have some scientific facts on this show. I'm not sure if you, you were probably busy for this, but there was a, um, a press conference yesterday at LPSC, one of the big conferences for space science. It wasn't, it was virtual this year, but a story yesterday that, in fact, the water on Mars, which has disappeared, the thought, you know, there's always been this question, where's it gone? Has it gone out through the atmosphere, lack of magnetic field being stripped? This paper suggests actually it's all still there in the crust, that there's a huge amount of hydrated minerals and that there's, an, there's oceans worth, and there's a whole, maybe a whole Mars worth of water still locked into the rocks all over, so not, not just at the poles. Um, so interesting results there. I mean, you know, you're always guaranteed a press release if you talk about water on Mars. I mean, how many have we seen, right? Hundreds of them. So. <laughs> well, we've got the, the, the slope linear, or however you pronounce it. The recurring the slope linear, RSLs. the RSLs, yeah. So, a couple so, of years ago, yeah. So controversial question, you know, um, and this kind of relates back to the, uh, the whole idea of how Mars has occupied this popular imagination as well. And of course, you know, as we all know, I mean, space exploration is no longer, you know, it's, it's never purely about science, is it? You know, it, it can sometimes be married to you know, national politics, you know, and just the prestige that's associated. I mean, we, we, we know all these things, right? But, you know, um, 
But there are other interesting planets. Is Mars the most interesting one? I mean, I, I don't know. Mercury, for well. instance. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Batum, there you go. That's slightly late. <laughs> well, it's funny. Venus I know was it's very Mars Day. last year. Yeah, Venus had a bit of a high point. Uh, uh, Venus and everyone's in like, oh. September. No. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, well, you know, all the planets are interesting in their own right for different reasons, and I should start by saying that. But. And there are, if you talk to a different planetary scientist, you'll get a different answer. Yeah, but, says Dallas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to make the case for Mercury, uh, because actually, you know, I do a lot of talking to kids about planets, and I almost always ask them what their favorite planet is, and no one says Mercury. And so I'm going around <laughs> trying to persuade people they should be interested in Mercury. But let me give you a good reason, not just like a scientific intricacy like, oh, it's interesting because the magnetic field does this, which I do think is true. But um, <laughs> thinking about it in the grander sense, actually, one thing that, that I think it's important to think about is we're looking at other stars. If you look up at stars in the sky, many of them may have a planet orbiting them, or many planets orbiting them. And part of sort of the latest discoveries of the last decade or two is finding these other planets and trying to understand what they look like and, and, and the characterizations of these planets. And many of the ones we found the planet's really close to their parent star, like super close. And that's partly because of our observation techniques favor finding planets that are close to their parent star. Um, and that's been really interesting because it's told us a lot about our own solar system. And, and we can talk about that more in a moment. But the point is Mercury is the planet closest to our parent star in our own solar system. And so one really great reason to study it is to try and understand what happens to a planet sitting in the outer atmosphere of the star, basically and then try and look at these other planets and use the knowledge we have of Mercury to understand them. And so I think you can make quite a compelling case for why we should understand Mercury and why it's an interesting sort of body to look at. Plus, it's a real anomaly in the solar system. It's got some really interesting features that make it stand out and that there's different from the other planets. And I think we have to understand the suite of planets that surround us that we can send missions to if we're ever going to have a hope of understanding the other planets elsewhere. It's Lecture funny, over. No, but it's funny how our storytelling brains doesn't favour Mercury because we no. can't imagine life on Mercury. There is an, un, an alienness about Mercury. So we go, well, obviously we're not yeah. going to get, it can't be life. But because the, Mars has that, well, A, the proximity and B, the familiarity, we our storytelling brains flash into action. Well, yeah, and, and, that, and that becomes the you're the exactly we, right. We like the most. And we see Mars in the night sky. So you know, many people have looked up and seen Mars. And the other planets we're interested in, if you ask people generally, are Saturn and Jupiter. And they're just visually beautiful and and completely mesmerizing in the images that come back. And I love Mercury, but I can't say it's the most mesmerizing looking yeah. planet there is. But so. but there's this very technical issue, right, for people that haven't thought about. It. Most people actually have never seen Mercury. Yes. Um, because it's so close to the sun, it never moves away far from the sun from our line of sight because it's interior to us. The same is true with Venus, but Venus gets is, is a bigger orbit and it can be very bright. So mm. a lot of people have seen Venus. But as you say, Mars is outside us, so it can be seen without looking close to the sun or, or worrying about dawn or dusk. But I, w I was going to ask a question quickly. So um, despite, it, may, it may depend on how old the kids are, but... How, how many times have you gone into a classroom and said, what's your favorite planet? And some smart Alec has actually said Pluto. And what do you do if they do? <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> actually, the most common one is Uranus with a lot of laughter. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, we don't pronounce it that way. Um, <laughs> Pluto. I always pronounce it. <laughs> but what is the, so just on the Mercury thing, because I think it's yeah. really important that people kind of get this picture about this anomaly. So it's a really dense planet. It's, yeah. it's, it's got this weird magnetic field which it yeah. shouldn't have so yeah. talk us through how it could have got there how more the more's the point how it could have been born somewhere else and ended up there and and well, been stripped of its outer parts and all that it may not be the thing that formed four and a half billion years ago no and but, actually that's where exoplanets are so interesting and have given us so much insight because many of us before we discovered exoplanets might have thought the planets as we see them today are in the locations that they have been in for the last four and a half billion years and actually, when looking at exoplanets, one thing that people have studied and noticed is that some of the giant planets we see close to their parent star simply cannot have formed there, according to our theories. And so they must have moved. They must have formed somewhere else and moved closer to their star. And that then began a conversation with our own solar system about maybe that could have happened to planets in our solar system. Ah, and now we have lots of wonderful theories about migrating planets. And we do think that Jupiter and Saturn certainly migrated early in the solar system's life towards the sun and then out again. And so people have began think, to think about maybe Mercury moved. It's really hard to explain. It's very, very dense. It's got this massive metal core. 
thin layer of rock around the edge. It doesn't look in structure like the other rocky planets, like Mars, like Venus, like the Earth. It looks different. It's very dense, very metallic. So yeah, you're right. People have talked about whether it kind of moved. It's still really hard to form it somewhere else and move it to where you see. I don't think that really explains it. And there was this lovely theory that I really liked where it got smacked by a load of objects, which we know it did early in its life. And that blasted away the rock section around the edge, right? So it got hit by loads of stuff, the rock blasted away and it leaves you behind a thin layer of rock and a load of metal. But the more we've sent missions to Mercury, the harder it is to kind of reconcile what we see with that theory. And so, you know, this question is just a hugely open and debated right. question uh, that we still don't know the answer to. And there's this business of, you know, volatiles on the surface, so stuff that really should have been boiled away billions of years ago at 450 degrees centigrade and and there's water in the poles explain again i'm, I'm, I'm going to dig yeah. in you've got, you know, you've got a mercury expert how yeah. on earth is there water on mercury when it's 450 degrees at the equator i love the story and if i told you there was water there 20 years ago you would have just like laughed me off your podcast and said I, I'm, I'm old enough that i remember when <laughs> i laughed at somebody for saying no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so this i love the story actually so it starts in the 1990s using the arecibo radio telescope and pointing it at mercury and they noticed that some regions near the poles seem to be reflecting the signal back really, really strongly. And so when they launched a mission to Mercury called Messenger, it was a NASA mission, first, the first mission to orbit the planet. One of the science goals that they came up with for this mission was what are what is this radar reflective material near the poles? It was just completely unknown. And they sent Messenger, the spacecraft, to Mercury, and they realized that this region that were reflecting all of these radio waves, they coincided with really deep craters. It's always near the poles, really deep craters near the poles. Meanwhile, we'd looked at the moon, and we'd already seen that the moon has really deep craters near the poles, and in those craters we have ice. And so then the sort of picture began sort of unraveling, and people began to realize, oh, okay, this radar reflective material in deep craters near the poles it's actually it's actually ice. And so these are called permanently shadowed craters. And this means that the sunlight can never hit the bottom of the crater. And so it remains an incredibly cold temperature. And that's how you're able to sustain <laughs> your ice. Another really great question. Sorry to interrupt you. And I'm going to yeah. stop lecturing in a moment. But I think it's fascinating is how it got there. Because yeah, clearly exactly. Mercury did not form with ice on its surface. It must have been delivered, delivered by impacts um, in Mercury's history, as we think water on the Earth was delivered. Yeah. And the key thing, of course, is that people will know that at the North Pole and the South Pole, there's times of the year when it's daylight, permanent daylight, 24 hours a day, and it's time when it's permanently dark. So they might ask, well, why isn't that happening on Mercury? And that's because Mercury is incredibly upright. It doesn't have a tilt in its polar axis, right? So it, just the sunlight never gets in there as much as it yeah. turns. Yeah, craters yeah. are deep, yeah, and the yeah. axis yeah. is little. Mm. Alex, you're sorry, you, you, you guys, you, you two go and have a beer, and Susie and I will talk about that. <laughs> you talk about yeah. <laughs> No, no, but I, I suppose as um, you know, Dallas said, um, you know, uh, yeah, unquestionably, um, it, it's the stories around Mars that seem to have captured people's imagination that way. And I, I guess it, but that for that very reason, it behooves us to kind of, I guess, sing the praises of all the other planets and the reasons for going there because of what we learn, the implications it has on how we appreciate our own environment, and so on. And yet, perseverance, you know, watching that footage. You know, perhaps even more so than the actual signal acquisition, seeing the video when it came back on the Monday, I think it happened on the Thursday, I think, and then on Monday, you saw, I mean, just, uh, it, it's kind of, it's kind of hard not to kind of marvel at just the ingenuity of people um, and what we are capable of and so on. And, and this is the thing, isn't it? Going back to films like The Martian and everything else, do you think that perhaps people lose sight of just how difficult Mars is specifically to do things on from the thin atmosphere to the ionizing radiation. Everything about Mars seems determined to kill robots. <laughs> and people. Yes, yeah. it is. I mean, it's, I can't remember what the statistic of failed Mars missions are. Half, maybe? Something like, yeah, half. I, yeah, it was amazing. It, things like that remind us of just how brilliant human beings can do. And I think that's why people liked it so much, seeing something and, and we're shaken off that, that anesthetic of the familiar. Uh, although it was really weird because even, even when I was watching that, I noticed a few people on Twitter saying, oh, well, what, why is this interesting? We've done it before. Yeah. Like already <laughs> bored yeah. of, of, of it, sort of forgetting how difficult it is to land yeah. on one time. But the pair, you two are, you know, science communicators, you know, you, you go out, you, you speak to the public in all sorts of audiences. And there is that, right? There is this point that there's a danger of us being in a bubble 
right? Our space geek bubble, people who watch in are fascinated by it. We get great feedback in the audience from the room we're in, but we we tend to shield ourselves off from the other people who are not in the room. And that's, on one hand, it's not important that they all think that what we're doing is interesting, but the flip side is that they're all paying for it. And there's, you know, a kind of a responsibility there. And it's also this broader issue. You might not be excited by space, but the things we do in space and how we do them, they need mathematics, they need physics, they, but they need teamwork, they need collaboration, they need rational evidence-based policy being used. And these are things which are much more important than beyond space. So, you know, it's sort of a serious question. How often I get quite depressed by this. I think I'm reaching well pretty much into a nice bubble. People are already converts. But I worry that the rest of society is sort of moving away and actually does look and go, ah, boring. I mean, I remember when Tim Tim Peake flew in space, there was a point in the newspapers after he'd been on lots of TV shows, some TV critics said, you know, it's that, that annoying Tim Peake is back on again tonight. And I'm thinking, really? Does it, you know, does it have to be like that? But but it is like that. And I don't know how we get over that. You must experience this. I mean, well, I suppose it's the, I mean, you know, it was the same with Apollo. I mean, everyone got very excited, you know, particularly Apollo 11, obviously. And then by the time we got to Apollo 12, everyone was slightly less interested. And by the time we got to Apollo 15, they cancelled the primetime shows and the, the world had moved on. Uh, you know, the, the, I guess that's just the way humans work. We are, we we crave novelty and we crave excitement. And, and I suppose a lot of people see these, these big engineering projects landing on Mars. We'll get excited for a short amount of time. And then they're off thinking about, you know, Megan and Harry or whatever the whatever the next <clears throat> headline headline is to distract us from the gaping emptiness of life, <laughs> the existential <laughs> crisis that we're all going through. Well, I think one of the interesting <laughs> things about perseverance going away from existential crises is that um, what they managed to do was stream it live to everyone's sitting room. And I think that's a real change in the way that, that we're able to communicate what's happening with these missions. So you're right, people got really excited about the landing. They're probably less excited now. Maybe when a helicopter flies, there'll be a bit more excitement. But certainly the landing, the way that we were able to watch the description, you know, minutes of terror as this thing approaches, I think a lot of people were captivated by yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it was on the news. It was on the, yeah. you know, not often space stuff gets on the news, but it was on the news. It was a big news event. You know, so it was on the BBC Breakfast. I saw people doing it on BBC Breakfast. Yeah. But, but, but do, go, go, going to ask this question, do you think, do you have a responsibility to talk more broadly? I mean, I'm paid by the general public. You are in a way, Susie, as well. Mm -hmm. Dallas, in a sense, you can pick and choose who you speak to, whoever pays you. And how much was it again for this evening? It was, uh, <laughs> well, I've, Many invoiced, beers. I've invoiced you. Yeah, um, but, but, you know, for me, at least, I struggle with this because I know that everybody who pays taxes, and it doesn't even matter, it's the general public, right, in the broadest sense, they pay for what I do. And I don't mean that they have to be excited, but there's some sort of sense that I need to give something back um, even if it's, you know, physics is a way of working things out, science, d voting, working, you know, and it just seems kind of a lost cause at the moment a bit. It just worries me. I get existential stuff, but... Wait, which, what, what, what worries you? The fact that you're not, that the general public aren't as re re receptive to... Well, I mean, look, I mean, the people, you say people were watching that and they were, and maybe yeah. actually it was a large number of people and we've seen it, you know, you launch a big rocket or you land on a comet, you can draw the people in. And I think we've done a pretty good job in science communication in the last decade. Uh, we've we've upped the game in terms of how we explain things. It's not just a patronizing, you need to know this. It's yep. common, you know, Definitely. what do you want to know? How can I help you? And I think, you know, you two are fantastic at that job. And there's lots of people who are brilliant. And at the same time, there's 5G conspiracy. There's, I mean, you know, we've, we've done this conspiracy stuff, Dallas, and that's just got yeah. worse, it seems, in the last 10 years. So it's as if we've separated into two groups. Well, so much of it, I think, has been accelerated by social media. In, in, you know, the fact that all of these voices are now there on display for anyone to pick whichever tribe they want. And that just didn't exist. I mean, I don't think human behavior has changed, but I certainly think the way that we speak to each other and the way that information is passed across. And a lot of the conspiracy theories, it does, you know, what you believe is a reflection about how you see the world generally. So if you are mistrusting of governments and of scientists, and if you think they're all in the being paid whacking great grants and all this kind of thing, <gasps> Well, and obviously they I are. <laughs> obviously, Mark's paid far too much money. Um, 
you know, that, spaceship. Look, it's, 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 it's unfortunately it's the way humans are. Humans are very tribal, and and you know we we, we see things in very simple ways, and so the nuance and complexity tends to get lost. I mean, I it's funny actually. I, I, I everyone says, oh, you should just ignore conspiracy theories, but I actually quite like poking conspiracy theories because I'm interested in what's going on. I'm interested in why they have rejected so much of stuff that I take yeah. for granted and, and, and love and I'm excited by. I, I just, cause I just don't understand. I mean, I'll, I'll talk to moon landing deniers and just, just to try and understand what on earth's going on. Well, but I think also one, one thing that we've talked about in the past is that people often have more than one conspiracy. It's not just one thing they don't believe in. There's well, that's the point. Yes. A whole range of. If you, but if you believe we didn't land on the moon, you probably also think chemtrails are a thing. Yeah. Or you think that right. Bill Gates is injecting you with nanoparticles. Yeah. Because ultimately it comes down to trust. It's about who do you trust in life. And if you, yeah. if you are mistrustful, if you are, feel you're outside of the conversation, then you can understand why you might think there are nefarious forces beyond your mm. means. And I, and I, I think we need, to, we need to better understand why people think the way they do. And this is what I mean about why I think science communication is so important. Science communication isn't just telling people facts. Fact it's, it isn't that at it's all. It's not that it? at all. It's not just <laughs> dropping a magnet down a copper tube and explaining what's going on. I quite like that. Which one, I quite but... like. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it, it's about it's about gaining trust and it's about reaching out to people and talking to people. The point about science is everyone should be everyone should be part of the conversation. Science is a human thing, and if people feel they're outside of it because they they see science as something other, then they, then you've got a real problem. Yeah, I mean there is this issue, and it's interesting because I've lived in. A bunch of different countries and seeing how different countries culturalize science so to speak yeah. um, and the uk you know as well as i do right there's a kind of a sniffy echelon of senior media people not the science journalists that you and i speak to but you know the people upstairs from there who will perfectly happily talk about the latest art house film or or magic realism book they've read but you know oh well i don't understand maths i don't understand physics let's get a boffin in to talk about it as if you can be a cultured person in modern life without actually science being part of it at all other countries it's not quite the same i would i would aver uh, and i think maybe you look at look at angela merkel right and uh, look at china china has a very large number of engineers and scientists in its upper echelons of politics now you may argue you know it's got its problems too but it's different to the culture in britain I, 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 I would put myself in that bracket, actually. It was a long, I spent most of my childhood, adolescence and early adulthood completely rejecting science for exactly the reasons that you said. I felt, partly because I wasn't very good at it, and so I just thought it wasn't for me. And there was that almost that kind of badge of honour about being bad at maths. And it was a, it's a terrible thing. It's, yeah. a, it's the thing I regret most in life, actually. Because you wouldn't do that about the humanities. No one would say, "Well, I would know. I, I can't read. Reading's rubbish." Yeah. <laughs> do you know what yeah. I mean? Um, I see somehow, no need for this. Yeah, but um, it, something clicked around about my mid twenties, or a couple of things clicked around about my mid twenties when I you're, realized you were, a late, you were a late developer then. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was a late developer, <laughs> you know, and I'm, clear, I'm only in my thirties now. Um, it was a couple of things that clicked where, I, where and it was actually through the humanities, was actually a director I was working with, this guy, Ken Campbell, who some, some of you may, may know, was a comedian and stuff, who, who was doing a, a documentary about sort of quantum mechanics. And his whole, his whole shtick was, I don't understand quantum mechanics, off I go to try and understand quantum mechanics. And I, it suddenly it was like, oh my God, you don't have to be a scientist to be fascinated in awe of these wonderful stories of science. And, and, and you know, from that, I, I, I read a couple of, popular science books. I, re I remember reading The Blind Watchmaker by Richard Dawkins and going, oh my God, why didn't I? And suddenly it was people telling the story of the stuff. And, it was like, yeah, and I suddenly felt, uh, you know, I'm invited to the party. And now I, I, I kind of get what it's all about. Uh, that's the thing. You don't have to be a scientist to be in love with science. You know, that's the thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm, I don't have to be a novelist to enjoy reading books, right? This yeah. is the thing. No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But people, but there is still that thing. I mean, the question I get asked the most, it's not the question I get asked the most, I get other questions asked. <laughs> but one of the questions I get asked a lot is, it's like, I'm always, people see me as a bit suspicious. Like, Aha, you're not a scientist. How come you're talking about science? Which is a bit like some pulling someone out of the cinema and going, aha, you watching a film, but you're not a film director, so why are you watching a film? Um, and and that we still do have this hang up about science. 
I don't know how you get rid of it. I've been trying my whole life to be the sort of token non-scientist. Well, you know, others, you know, Robin Ince and, and, and uh, there are others, of course. Um, but I think it's really important. I think it's really important actually to have non-scientists talking about science. To yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Well, well, this the thing, though, isn't it? It's it's creating a, an emotional dimension. Exactly. That can exactly. Yes. And so that's right. so. So thank you. Yeah. So it's it's storytelling. It's it's appealing to people's sense of curiosity and adventure, and all that. Um, shout out to uh, Matt Taylor, who's watching tonight. Remember him? <laughs> Hello, oh, Matt. Matt. Taylor. One well. of our favorite people. There you Hi, go. Matt. Matt, <laughs> Matt transcends science. He's sort of beyond <laughs> science, into the into yeah. the story realm. He, he transcends many things. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember he, he once said very well, it's just, I mean, there's something fundamental about space exploration. It's akin to us just wondering what's over the next hill, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, well, Feynman said it as well, you know, what if science is picking up stones to see what's underneath in the rock pools? You know, that's why we do it, because it's because it's interesting. So we've got your, you've got your origin story a little bit there, Dallas, the science. What about you, Susie? I mean, you just, you just sort of died in the wool, always picking up stones from the age of five, or was there a moment? I mean, how, how did that happen to you? No, I spent my entire youth on a lacrosse pitch running around hitting other people with sticks, frankly. I didn't do much. I wasn't any great scientist. Yeah, I, I was much more into sport and other things. Yeah, I just kind of tumbled here, like just got interested and then just kept going. And I think when people ask, oh, what would you say to people who want to go into science? I always say just get interested in something and don't stop until you have to. And I guess nothing's kind of stopped me yet. So still going down that down that line of things. But uh well, yeah, got, did, you not have a, did you not have a kind of a sort of a seminal moment of sort of reading something? Or? No, not at all. No, no, sem no seminal moments for me. Nothing that profound. Well, I, I will warn you that, you know, at some point um, when somebody says, uh, do you want to be a manager? That might be the time to get off the bus. <laughs> <laughs> no one in their right mind would say that. <laughs> I think I'm safe. <laughs> I used to work in Pizza Hut and, and uh, then tried to make me a manager and I, that's when I left. Because I, I enjoyed the creative process. Of <laughs> I so creative within problem. certain parameters, certain yeah. fixed parameters. Yeah. Yeah. It's a millimetre too large, Mr. Yeah. Campbell. <laughs> yeah. Happy so, day. I've never been, I was really happy being a pizza You once told me that was like, your most sort of proficient. Was well, I was really good. I was a really good waiter. Uh, and he could also still name all the toppings on every Pizza Hut pizza, as we discovered like last week. So. Yeah. So Dallas, trick question: Which planet in the solar system is at the temperature of a pizza oven? Well, it's, I, <laughs> Susie corpsing because. Well, I don't, I, well, I, it could be Venus, I suppose, depending on where you are. No, no, that would char charcoal and sulfuric acid charcoal. Not a good yeah. idea. Yeah. But I suppose if you went high up in the atmosphere of Venus, you'd probably get you'd go for Mercury. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Right now. Just to put everybody out of their agony. <laughs> so Mercury pizza oven, except you, you must get the, where it gets really, because on the back side of Mercury, it gets really this cold. Is a, this is a smart, yeah. So here's the question. Yeah. The, what's it called, ring? The um, Terminator. Terminator. Yeah. Not, not the Terminator, <laughs> uh, but the Terminator. There must be a point where it's just right. So people often say, like, could, right. could we put astronauts on Mercury? And I say, well, the day side, you know, 450 degrees, the night side, minus 180 degrees, really tricky. And then the next question is always, if I ran fast enough, could I keep myself in that little bit between the two? Mm, no. and I, don't, I don't know. But you can, not. right? I mean, isn't there, a, I think if you actually, fast. if you work out how fast the Terminator moves across the surface, it isn't far off walking distance. Walking well, actually, and, and, the, yeah, and you're right, because see? Mercury rotates really slowly. So yeah. Mercury yeah. Day is 59. So Earth. actually, there's a science fiction story, and it'll come back to me who it is, because it's, it's to do with having a city... On, on a rail and the rail moves around Mercury and to, to keep away from the Terminator. But it's close, as in the daylight part. Yeah. But it gets close enough that people can then walk out ahead of it and see the sunrise come over the hill ah. and close their visors and walk away. And if you get trapped out there and it's this whole business of dicing with death at the Terminator on Mercury. Somebody out there will know, maybe somebody will put it into the Q&A on YouTube. Wasn't it deep impact in that happened? Are you there, asking me a film a, There was some Terminator question. business. Was that oh. the one with the, when they were on the on the um, meteorite and they had to detonate? Oh yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, actually the sun rises uh, over the, the comet. Sun, and, yes, that was. Yeah, I think and, Armageddon, I think, when they uh, they landed on it. Armageddon. Uh, I think the impact was. Armageddon. Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Aerosmith. No, no, no. All yeah, there, there, there's a there's a divider, it's, right? Du Deep Impact or Armageddon. One of those films is good, and the other one isn't a film either at all. But all, all, all respect to Jason Isaacs, of course. No, yes, no. well, there is that Jason Isaacs story, Marginal. which we're not allowed to say here to do with Demi, <laughs> Demi Moore. But uh, oh yeah, we we did a Space Rocks with Jason we Isaacs. We did, we did. But 
but but it's not it's it, this is a child friendly program and Jason's anecdote is not so uh, I do not remember really? this exciting yeah, exactly a, a private after show relating of yes. Jason <laughs> <laughs> the point is he tells it everywhere he goes to a space event you will hear it in the future oh nice look forward nice. to that I've got a rude Oliver Reed story. Do you? But I went, yeah. I wouldn't remember Aren't, they, aren't they all rude? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> this one's particularly good. You'll enjoy it, but another time. <laughs> so, um, so bringing some of our audience in, we have people watching from all over the world. And of course, a uh, big shout out to UK Space Agency, um, UK ESRO office, you know, who have- Thank you, ESRO, for today. Hey. Yeah, Sunday, fun, fun Mars Indeed. Day. So it's great to see some um, um, some new faces, um, you know, in chat watching us tonight, of course. And um, I mean, just getting back to just uh, something that was said before, really briefly. I mean, you know, very understandably, no matter what happens, um, inevitably, uh, people frequently refer back to landing on the moon as a benchmark for us all. And perhaps what unites that with Mars is because we also think we're going to go there. I mean, just look at what we've talked about tonight. The thing that separates it from missions like Rosetta, of course, you know, Matt Taylor watching and so on, is the fact that, you know, human beings go. And so it captures our imagination in a way. But of course, when we say we are going to go there, it's very different from the era of Apollo, isn't it? Because of course, now uh, you have people like Elon Musk talking about going there to settle down. Now, Nick Howells, who is watching tonight, you know, um, you know asked, I think, a, a very legitimate question. You know, I mean, so what goes through your mind when you hear people talking about setting down on Mars and writing our own laws? and so on is that is that obviously we've talked about before how that's kind of a figment of people's imagination but at the same time um is that something we need to begin kind of thinking about in context of starlink and other things that are happening where laws haven't quite caught up with people what people can do uh i kind of think we do don't we i mean i think that, you know the laws that we have are sort of based on things like the antarctica treaty that we we as a collective society have said, look, Antarctic is too important for us to just be drilling willy nilly and exploring and planting flags and, and owning things. Um, and we, you know, I suppose the outer, I'm not an expert, but the Outer Space Treaty has similar things. You can't sort of claim. Yeah, yeah, it was based on it, on based on the Antarctic Treaty. The, yeah, you can't sort of claim ownership of the moon. But of course, as we get more and more sophisticated, as we put more and more stuff into space, as we discover more and more things like important minerals on the moon and suddenly other human factors like greed and take over yeah we do need to start to think about how what kind of frameworks we need to put in into place otherwise you know what things like wars start and bad things happen and so yeah i do think we need to certainly be thinking about those yeah. kinds of things and what do you think i mean susie talk us a little bit through the, the whole business of planetary protection and the way that you know yeah. in the both directions that it goes as well right it's a, not only about us going somewhere where there might be life but about coming back the other way so talk us yeah. through that a bit sure and this is this is really relevant we're talking about perseverance uh, today uh, mars day and this is really relevant to the perseverance mission so perseverance is taking samples of rock and those samples of rock uh, are one day going to be picked up and brought back through a series of missions to the earth and so, like you say, it's a two way issue with Mars. So anything we send to Mars has to be decontaminated. And that's because we know that there are some forms of life on Earth, basic life on Earth that can survive, like tardigrades, for example, that can survive the journey through space and could then perhaps colonize Mars. And what we don't want to do is colonize Mars accidentally with these creatures that, that, that then do really well and then send something to look for life on Mars and funnily enough we find it it looks just like life on Earth so like, we don't want to do that we don't want to contaminate Mars with life on Earth but you're completely right so we're super careful with everything we send we think really carefully about how we design things to make sure that things are decontaminated etc the return journey as well is really interesting so we want to bring rock samples back from Mars and I was talking today to an expert actually in meteorites and I asked her why 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 do we want the samples from Mars why can't we just look at Martian meteorites she had this amazing answer. She said the Martian meteorites that land on the Earth, um, they're, they're fundamentally different. We want to look at sedimentary rock and there are no sedimentary Martian meteorites on the Earth. So we need to go to a sedimentary piece of rock and we need to collect a sample to bring it back. And we want sedimentary rock because that's most likely to have captured any evidence of past history of life on Mars. Because That's the kind of rock that you find life, history of life uh, on the Earth. But but actually bringing that that rock back that introduces some really interesting questions. You know, when you bring it back to the Earth, what we don't know what's in that particular sample. So we have to be really careful with the curation facilities associated 
with bringing that material back. We use things called double walled isolators. That's protecting their sample from the earth and the earth contamination and protecting us from contamination from the Martian sample as well. And so there are laws around planetary protection yeah. for this reason. I mean, we saw that with the Apollo missions, all the astronauts yeah. when they came back from the moon were put in isolation for two weeks because we just didn't know the idea of, of bugs from the moon. You know, it was a, well, you, was, you say that, I mean, did it happen on the later missions? It happened on 11, definitely. But I think they actually stopped after a while. Oh, I they? think you might be right. I can't Because they sort of said, well, actually, there isn't anything. Yes, I think you might be right. Certainly, yes, it was on on the Hornets. They had the um, yeah, yeah. Nice, their sort of nice airstream caravan. I was always slightly jealous of their sort of two weeks. In a... you, I'm surprised you haven't bought one, right? An airstream, just so you could go and live inside <laughs> yeah. it for a while. I, funnily enough, don't we have, didn't someone drop some tardigrades on the moon the other day? I don't know, did they? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. they did. It, wasn't, mm. it, wasn't, it was the Israeli mission Bereshit. Um, mm. They were put on without being declared on the manifest. Um, which, of course, violated any laws in the first yeah. place about doing it. Um, and they were in this ton state, this dried, desiccated state, yeah. um, which is the only way they can survive. It's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, you mentioned tardigrades, and we've had Nicole Kaplan on before, who studies those for the European Space Agency. They're not actually extremophiles at all. They don't like living in extreme places. They can survive in those places yeah. if, they, if they're dry when they go there. Yeah. Um, there are other bugs which just love to be around you know, black smokers or in places with high radiation. Um, but the ones that were sent to the moon were in this dehydrated state. So there's no water there to rehydrate them. And anyway, it's the moon, right? But somebody did that. And imagine you do it on a mission to Mars. Then it becomes much more relevant, right? Um, so, Mark, tell me tell me what the ramifications were for this mission. They didn't declare them on the manifesto, sent them to the moon. What happened? Private. It's a private mission. I think there was some spot. I, mean, I don't know the full details of how Bereshit was funded, but it was partly private money. I think there was some Israeli government uh, in, involvement. They did declare the manifest in terms of all the bits and pieces, but the the you know there was an encyclopedia on board saying human knowledge to the moon, and there were there were non scientific bits of payload. Mm. But the person who was in charge of the mission snuck on the tardigrades at the last minute and didn't tell anybody, but then put his hand up afterward and say, "I did it," and it's that as well. It's that sort of showing off thing right i have broken your rules your yeah, rules what are you mean nothing do? to me yeah, yeah. And i think then that, that's the issue for mars as well we've heard that about you know to hell with planetary protection how are you going to enforce it i'm just going to take all these humans there and and by definition humans are symbiotic with all sorts of bugs right yeah. we die if we don't have all sorts of bacteria inside us so we have to take them with us and the first time you you know chuck the crap out the door and there you are so how you, and we have to think about in the civil space agencies because our, our astronauts take a shit as well as anybody else's, but 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 you know we you have to think about that enormously carefully. Um, whereas if you're going to take hundreds and hundreds of people, there's going to be problems. It's just not going to be sustainable in that way. And I think you'd really need to think very hard about sending humans to to Mars um, for exactly the reasons you described. But of course, there are places where we think there could be life and there couldn't be life. It's quite nuanced, right? Yeah, we, you would have to do it in a very sort of controlled way. I think we're, we're, you know, the idea of lots and lots of people living on Mars is so fantasy at the moment. It's so remote. Anything that happens on Mars will be something like an Antarctic base, that kind of like, something like Concordia, one could imagine. And there are things, you know, there's laws in Antarctica. You can't, you know, do a poo in Antarctica outside. You've got to collect it all up and dispose of it properly and and we should have those sorts of things. Yeah. well but i bet if you go to a place like mcmurdo you'll find that it you know have they been followed right the more and more you just put people in there there's always going to be somebody who's going to yeah humans are messy mm -hmm. humans are messy mm -hmm. yeah i mean uh, I think, yeah one of the um one of the i think it was apollo 12 actually they they were they retrieved a bit of uh, a, a lunar probe, and I, I forget which one. Surveyor. Yeah, Surveyor, thank surveyors, you. Yeah. yeah, and th there was sort of bacteria on that that had yeah. survived exactly. the X amount of years that it had been on there. Yeah. And it's like, blimey, you know, yeah. life is pretty hardy. You know, the fact they could survive the lunar surface for five years or whatever it was. Yeah. I was re reading a story, a very interesting study done on the space station, um, on the Japanese side, which actually, you know, so often we talk about this thing called lithopanspermia, this idea that life might be buried in a rock, deeply embedded and can survive the journey across space um, if it's ejected as a meteorite, this business of Martian meteorites, um, because it's in the rock and it's shielded from radiation and everything else. But the Japanese did an experiment where it's, it's, it's called, what do they call it? Massapanspermia. So the idea being that, no, you're not wrapped in a rock. 
it's just a mass of bacteria and, and primitive life that shield the ones on the inside, a kind of microbial mat, which we have lots of on the Earth, and probably primitive Mars had it in those Microbial days. mat, that's a good nickname for Mars. Yeah, that, well, he's... Microbial <laughs> <laughs> mat. Um, but, but, the, but there's enough shielding kind of from the dead bacteria that it can survive at least thousands of years in space. Um, maybe not millions that it might take to come across that, that divide. But yeah, life has a way. And, uh, and it always comes to this question, which is fascinating. If we do find life on Mars, um, maybe it turns out to be the same as life on Earth anyway, because maybe they've been cross-contaminated in the early, you know, early solar system. So really, actually, people, a lot of other people say, well, Mars, who cares? Let's go and look for life under the icy crusts of the Jovian moons yeah. or Enceladus or in, on Titan where there's liquid hydrocarbons. That ain't going to be our kind of life. But wouldn't that be amazing if there was some kind of life that had formed totally independently? Because that's the real question, right? We want to know whether life formed twice in the universe. Yeah, exactly. Finding that's on Mars and the same as Earth would be very disappointing mm -hmm. in some sense. But then you get the kind of the, the sort of Paul Davies idea, which is, well, why are we even looking on Mars or Enceladus or Europa? Why aren't we looking for a separate abiogenesis here yeah. on Earth? And if we could find something here, then you, you know that that it you know life happened twice here. Then well, then well, we were talking about Matt a, Matt a moment ago, weren't we? So. Uh... Which was? He's we were talking about, about Matt a moment okay. ago. Well, exactly. Yes, microbial Matt. And Living under our noses. The biogenesis. <laughs> the, um, just once again, bringing the, uh, the audience in, um, uh, Detlef, uh, I think the title you're looking for, Mark, is uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's 2312. That's it. Kim yep. Stanley, there's exactly who it is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think as James Green points out, I think the statistic we were looking for is um 27 successful missions to mars 25 failures um if yep. that's right then oh wow. I mean, that's no i think that's that, that's a bit extreme i think yeah, I mean, actually, yeah this, this this trope about mars missions failing is actually it's historically biased as well a lot more of them work now yes um yeah. uh, so you know interesting story i don't know you were speaking to jim green earlier on from nasa yeah. um and other people. I heard um, from, um, we, I think Jonathan Amos said it actually, he was on a couple of weeks ago, and he pointed out that Curiosity in 2012, this is real tension about the sky crane and landing the rover on the surface. And we all, you know, watched that and thought, that's no way that's going to work. And he said, you know, the NASA people this time said, actually, we were quite relaxed about it relatively because we've done it before. We know the parameters. Um, but but um, yeah, they, they've made it look really easy um, in a sense. Um, in Europe, we have not managed it yet, so we're you know really anxious for ExoMars in 2022 to finally prove that we can do it as well. So it isn't easy by any means, but uh, yeah, I don't think the failure rate's 50 percent anymore. But. Yeah, I mean, but, but but what's also interesting, of course, is um, you know much closer to home. Artemis, you know, which we we're just talking about. I mean, just uh, just just when you're speaking of international efforts or just something that is ambitious, uh, within reach, and imminent, you know, as well. It's just it's a truly mind blowing time for exploration. Now, it's obviously probably my own bias, perhaps ours collectively, you know, to say that we're living in a golden age right now. But it just seems everywhere you look, there is something absolutely astonishing that we are achieving. And there's no question that um, it's something to get excited about. And I suppose it's just trying to kind of feed off, I think, what someone said in the chat really, really brilliantly. It's just holding on to that childlike fascination with it all. Because I think, you know, kids like astronaut Hayden, who's watching tonight, you know, was fires to land on an asteroid and um, hats off, fantastic aspiration. I think that, um, you know, it, it's, it's about kind of holding on to that enthusiasm, you know, and sharing that with people. Because I think, you know, particularly in times of COVID right now, um, you know, uh, it's 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 a beacon for people, I think, as well. Mm. You know, it's it's more than just the science, isn't it? Well, you're it's, you're right. We're story animals, you know, that's what humans are. And you said you said it earlier on, like so we, you know, we 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 work on an emotional level. And when we see these great stories of exploration and we see these wonderful spectacles of landing on comets and you know, whatever Elon Musk talking about the frontier and going to Mars, we we react to it. It, it means something. 
Yeah, I think I think what's interesting about that, and I, you know, I'm sort of playing the grumpy old man today. You'll get Richard. cross here, my I hate. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm not getting. No, I'm not, I know you get cross. No, I'm not going to get. No. <laughs> <laughs> so where's my Hulk Zoom background? That's the one I have to put that one up to calm myself. No, I just I wonder also. It comes back to this question about some of us engaging with it and others not. Um, and I think that there is this issue which people have to get a hold of. I mean, childlike fantasy going to the moon. There are lots of people in society who say, look, we've got bigger problems here, right? Stop your messing around. And I think there is an adult child interface there. And it's probably things like Earth observation and yeah, exactly. telecoms and so on. Right. The fact that spa <laughs> space <style> interface. <laughs> well, like, you know, space is really important to planet Earth. And it's a, like, yeah. you, know, we, you know, it's the old Arthur C. Clarke thing, right, about technology when it's sufficiently advanced. Um, you know, it's like magic. And, and we've actually, in some ways, we've removed space from people's lives. They don't know that their phones get them to the pub. Well, nobody goes to the pub, but you know what I mean. Um, it's satellites that help them do that, that drive their cars. It's satellites that help us monitor the weather and so on, because it's they take it for granted. And somehow we have to get that back into the dialogue as well, don't we? That space isn't just about fantasies and Buck Rogers and ray guns and running around the universe. Because a lot of people think that's childish, right? We know there's good reasons to go and do it, but space, the the other stuff, is really vital to our everyday lives, and I think there's a there's a lot to be talked about that. Yes, no, I agree, and yeah, particularly, again, cult, particularly culturally, right? Because Europeans and Americans are quite different, I think, in that regard. People take it all so for granted. I mean, you know, you hold up your your cell phone, your smartphone. You know, you've got. The entire world's history's knowledge you can carry around in your pocket. Everything is there. You can talk to anyone at any point on earth. You can buy things and they're delivered. You know, but within a year, we're moaning about it. It's like, oh, my phone's too slow, or I've got to get the latest <laughs> one. We get bored so easily by, you know, miracles that are happening all, all the time. And that's, you know, that phrase, the anesthetic of familiarity. Humans are so, we are so anesthetized by the miracles around us so quickly that it takes, something like a an amazing spectacle a space mission to, to shake us out of that even if it is a temporary thing i don't know how to keep that that sort of sense of wonder and sense of importance it's a thing i call just you know because it, i don't know you you experience it i think many people do this what i call cosmic vertigo this occasional moment in your mm. life when you are detached from the normality of walking through a building or you know yeah. picking going to the shops and suddenly realize you're on this planet and it's orbiting the the sun at 30 kilometers a second and that the galaxy you're moving through the galaxy at 200 kilometers a second and neutrinos don't give a crap that you exist and and so on and so on don't say that um you know neutrinos the least caring particles of all they just don't care about me but um or what wimps wimps exactly well, but but you know so occasionally you get into that right radio waves all of the world's music is flying past you now marla's marla's fifth symphony is going past your head if you could only reach out and grab it with your radio receiver right they can. how does that work i can just do it yeah so it's you know crazy. it's it is crazy. weird but occasionally you need that moment right to step outside of that normality but maybe we can't maybe the, maybe we've evolved because if we we if we were in a perpetual state of wonder which i I am all the time but if we were all in a perpetual state of wonder all the time nothing would get done we'd just be like i can't there's no point in doing anything because the heat death of the universe and we're all buggered you know point. so we have to kind of beneath our ties ourselves from the craziness of this is yeah, the problem with it with theory of mind you know humans have evolved this theory of mind we we see minds we can empathize and that you know and we're aware of our own mortality and that that places you know fundamental problems yeah, of us yeah. so we have to kind of ignore the kind of crazy stuff yeah. indeed. indeed and you know i mean to, to to pull a few of those threads together though um obviously you know familiarity um with our own earth perhaps gives us a little less appreciation than we should have for it right i mean if there's one thing and it's come up frequently on nothing certainly is just that the more we learn about these alien worlds you know um the more we i think probably should appreciate you know just how rare um the earth is and just how precious it is because it's not something we can reproduce anywhere else you know and i suppose it's fascinating to learn about these other worlds but at the same time that earth observation that thing that gives us a new perspective on earth but also tells us what's happening with earth i think is just so important and fundamental to space exploration and that of course isn't just about discovery that's about alerting us to the very real problems that face us 
right now. I mean, and I, I think we could probably talk forever. Um, <laughs> and because, we will uh, talk forever. <laughs> indeed, indeed. But, uh, but, but for tonight's show, at least, I have to say that's a really well-rounded conversation. And um, Dallas and Susie, on behalf of everybody watching tonight, everyone at Space Rocks, what a pleasure it is to have you back. And let's do it again sometime soon. We, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, thank yeah, you love so you. much. It's thank such a you. pleasure. Yeah. I mean, you guys have got your competing uh, uh, thing that you do on Thursdays as well, right? Once oh, a month, Space I think. Oh, Spacebar, yeah. Indeed. So tell us a little bit about that because we, we, you know, we love cross-cultural. We're not talking about Stuart Clark and the thing he's doing this evening but uh, for Astro <laughs> Fest. Well, but, Spacebar, uh, we, we do on thir- every other Thursday um, with Astro Agency, which is a Scottish uh, space company. They do sort of space PR and, and, and this kind of stuff. And it's, a, it, well, it's just sort of an open Zoom call where anyone can join. And we have guests talking about the space industry generally. And we have panels and all kinds of interesting people come and join us. Uh, next Thursday, this is my little plug, the oh, 25th yeah. there you go. is, the, is the, our anniversary. And we've got some special guests. We've got some astronauts. Peak. Oh, oh, we're not allowed to say what his name no, is. No, no, yeah. We're... An Easter astronaut. Some lovely mystery until mystery. Dallas goes and Sorry. blurts <laughs> out. Mystery guest joining us next Kevin week. Song we've got. Dallas. Sorry. Anyway, well, we've got, we've got yeah. Great. Well, let's see. I think maybe this is the moment. We don't normally do it with the guests on the line, but I think that, you know, Alex, I think your moment is here. So you can go and listen to them and talk to astronauts and so on. Who do we have on next week? Oh, ah. don't. This is good. We, we, we're, we're complimenting each other. We're, we are. We're on the same time, though. You can always watch, you can always watch us on YouTube afterwards. Let's just trash each other's... Um, uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, ours is well, less uh, of a show. You, you've got the show thing going on. Ours, <laughs> ours is more of a kind of industry chat that are networking yeah it's, yeah that kind of thing. anyway who have you got on who next week on? <laughs> okay so um well, no he's on our show uh, let's, <laughs> let's see let's see how well you know your star wars trivia um well he is the lyricist of popular ewok song yub and up <laughs> i love star wars i'm looking for dallas in this one his, his 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 dad wrote the music for it no, oh, all of Star Wars or just that song? All of Star Wars. Oh, well, I love the Star Wars. Well, it music, was, um, so that's awesome. what's his name was the Star Wars with our friend um, John Williams. John Williams, thank you. Yes. Yes. But it's not John that we have on the show. Nope. We um, have well, instead his, his, his son, who wrote the lyrics for the um, Ewok song, also um, sings for a, 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 a popular band who you could say one of their more popular hits um, is About the Continent. It's about a, a continent, Europe. It's a uh, final yeah, countdown, Europe. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, America yeah, we have... by Simon and Garfunkel. Oh, good Indeed. one. It is. So we have uh, Joseph Joseph Williams, who is the singer of Toto on next Thursday. Oh, oh nice. 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 That's a- a- Africa. You nearly, you would have got there. Africa. Africa. <laughs> in every other continent. Uh, All right. I should have spun that out a little more. We hear the drums. We hear the, okay. <laughs> 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 So yeah, he's a, he's, he's a, a lead singer of a, a very well-known band, but has some space credentials there, as you might That's imagine. A, yeah, you know, nice. my favorite music space I heard the other day, um, um, Rick done? Armstrong, Neil Armstrong's, you, you will have met Rick Armstrong. Uh, we, yes. Yeah, <laughs> Reg, regularly. He's been regularly. to Space okay. Rocks, yeah, yeah. Well, here's the thing about, you know, I was chatting to him the other day in the Cheltenham Festival Green Room. And I was saying, what do you do? He said, I'm a musician. He's, and he plays guitar. He played guitar from, with Marillion. Yeah. Who are yeah. my favorite band, one of my favorite bands. When I oh, was really? Kid. Yeah. I, I, and for one of my first gigs I went to was Marillion. I got so, into Marillion script for a Jester's Tear, so pre-misplaced childhood. Okay. We've they had Marillion like, on, Marillion have been on Space Rocks. Shut up. Well, we have. Really? We've had Steve, we've had Steve Rothery with Rick Armstrong on oh, Space on, on Uplink, and, but we uh, but, but we have not had we have not had Steve Hogarth on. He has been to a Space Rocks event, so if we can arrange you, Dallas, and Steve Hogarth, how about that? I'd love that. I tell you what, and um, can we get a Marillion and get Fish back on as well? Is <laughs> um, I suspect I suspect there's a Pauli exclusion principle involved there. <laughs> exactly. <because. laughs> oh, no. Well, Two lead singers of Marillion at the same time in the I same know, room. Not a like, like a matter antimatter annihilation. <laughs> but in prog rock. <laughs> well, well. Speaking of antimatter and a popular TV show that uses it in almost every episode, whenever they need to blow up the ship. Um, <laughs> before you guys go, we have a little Star Trek. We program. do have a tradition, which which you will know, Dallas, because you've done it before. So we need you to be able to do the Vulcan salute, live long and prosper. Well done, Susie. And yeah, the rocks. Indeed. 
space rocks. So there, there you go. go. The hand signal is all you need. And now we know right. we've, we've outed you, Dallas, as a Marillion fan. So it's great yeah. stuff. Thank you very much, guys. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you for having you on. Thanks great for coming. Thank Thank you. You. So much fun. See you Thanks soon. for inviting us. <laughs> See you See soon. You. Bye. Bye bye. Well, Mark, that was fun. Jeez. Yeah, it was. There you Did go. We talk about Mars in the end. Or, uh... <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> occasionally. Yeah. What a, what a fantastic chat and what brilliant people. I mean, I guess uh, proof positive um, why uh, they were so loved at our um, live event and also, you know, uh, on the streams that they've been on as well. Fantastic people. Absolutely. And, uh, so just again, let's let's say it again, because we kind of got lost in all the humor there that the guest next week will be Joseph Williams, uh, current lead singer of the band Toto, who many of you will know. And uh, and as Alex said, you know, connections to Star Wars like you wouldn't believe personally and through his father. So, uh, yeah, what, what what is the better mix for Space Rocks and all of this craziness uh, than somebody like Joseph? It should be a lot of fun. Thanks so much to everybody for joining us tonight. We'll have details about next week's show. Um, uh, 8 p.m. GMT, 9 p.m. CET. And uh, we'll be pinging you on the Mission Update newsletter, um, the second of which just went out today so sign up at spacerocksofficial.com and mark as ever an absolute pleasure i like the first 42 theory the asterisk one <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's uh, a good one I, i'm gonna have to do a bit of re reading there but uh yeah, we'll never excellent know. we'll, never we'll know. see where it goes all right yeah. be well. thanks alex thanks, thank you everybody good night <laughs>